Welcome to Inside Shopify UX. I'm your host, Lola Yelayo Pearson, UX Director at Shopify. On today's episode, I speak with founder and CEO of Shopify, Toby Looker. We'll reminisce about some of Shopify's previous designs, chat about the value of design systems, and of course, play a game of Kiss, Marry, Kill. Let's get into it. I am absolutely delighted to have Toby Looker on the show today for us to talk about all things UX, and I have been promised strong opinions and things that will definitely make the discussion interesting. So I'm going to poke for all of those things. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Toby. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Cool. So I want to go straight in with like a question that's just good framing, because I, I think like your external brand is very much like the developer CEO, like getting into all the code. But you're also very opinionated about user experience and design. So like frame that for the audience. Like what is your ethos and philosophy around user experience? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a big, that's a big topic. So like I, maybe, so absolutely, like I, I'm uh, in, in terms of my skill set, I'm engineer. I, I, I'm uh I'm extremely bad at designing things. Um, uh, like uh, I, I have some fun stories about early Shopify days that uh, maybe even illustrate this. Um, but um, I, uh, I, I'm a. I mean, I partly have been around like the, the internet long enough. Like it used to be that um, one person actually kind of did everything, right? Like that's that's sort of I guess yeah. where we started. And um, the full stack web developer that just did absolutely everything. It was. It was. Um, yeah, and it's interesting, right? Like even, I mean, there was no such term, right? It was just like you did things on the internet. Uh, and, and so that involved, um, you know, reasoning uh, around network protocols, uh, you know, deterministic um, uh, stacks, and of course, engineering. But um, you did all of this for, for, for a very particular purpose, which was um, so that, uh, you know, people would get software of one way or another. And in, in, especially in the early sort of, like in the, in the 90s, or actually, I, I'm sort of trying to, I, I heard someone frame the 90s as uh, the late 2000s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or the early 2000s. No, the, 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 yeah. The late twenty first century, twenty uh, century, or something like this. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a funnier framing about this. Old. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not okay with that framing. Yeah, that's yeah okay. So <laughs> cut, cut this out. But like, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, but, uh, but but I, I think it's it's worthwhile to make it like sound further away because it really is further away. Like back then, like every time someone built something, it was basically the first time people got something. And um, uh, so, but you built for people, right? And so I have always, uh, you know, I grew up in Germany, which is. Um, uh, my my experience is like my, my parents also are not people who can design things. Um, uh, but like the nice thing about growing up in Germany in the you know eighties and nineties is that the sort of products that um, uh, people just had in their houses were like largely designed by I mean Dieter Rams and others, right? Like yeah. the, the yeah. nice thing is you you go in a museum now and 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 see these exhibits and. That's actually like what a living room in Europe looked like during those times. So there was a uh, it, it was a time um, of uh, you know terrible haircuts, but also a really 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 good product design. Uh, you know there was a, there's, there's a sort of materiality to these things which is uh, powerful, and so you you are surrounded by this. And then uh, you know I encountered like computers and like you, you wrote some basic and wrote some code, but. Um, uh, Clearly not the same kind of thought went into this. It was clear that there was potential to bring these principles to, to into this world, but that hasn't happened. And, um, you know, like, I, I guess, um, with not wanting to like, spend too much time on this, I, I, I'm, I consider myself sort of a Toronto Raptors super fan of UX. <laughs> it's like, it, it's, it's like I, 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 I jump around and I see something amazing uh, because I, I find every time it is, it is such an incredible discipline because um, uh, the, the most powerful thing in a, uh, that, that, that we've been working on, I think, in the, you know, in the last probably half century is uh, the world of com computing and software, but none of it can be utilized to the benefits of people without actually making it sensible and approachable. And so it, the entire point is 
um, to make great UX. It supports that because you want to give people amazing abilities. I, I absolutely believe that fundamentally. It's like the tech should be designed around people, not for the tech's sake. But UX does have this huge spectrum, right? So like one of the successful things we've done as a discipline is we've professionalized, mm -hmm. right? So we've created it and we've made it a craft. We've made it so that there are qualifications. There are specific skill sets that you need. But then there's this kind of other end of it, which is still kind of like creative and subjective, right? So you, you were talking about essentially mm -hmm. like Bauhaus design principles, which a lot of people love and there's a lot of great deconstruction of it, but it's also like quite stark style and quite stark taste. Yeah. And there are entire cultures that absolutely would hate that because it feels flat. And so there's this creative layer. So it's, I'm interested in like how you've kind of seen that through Shopify, like how are we balancing? Because we've had people on the episode talking about hydrogen and dev docs and how opinionated and bold and specific the taste and the style that we've gone through is there, but still this kind of very functional and purposefully designed um, surfaces. So how, have you, how do you rationalize those two things of like designing for the user, but also having like a strong opinion that means somebody's not going to like it, right? Yeah, I think... Um... Uh, there's a couple of different ways to get at this, but um, uh, I, I I think the, I mean, fun is one of those things. Like, I think this is sort of a general criticism of Bauhaus. It's like, it's, so I like to figure out what's behind things. So, so I, I, I love, um, I, I love a story behind the object, usually a lot more than the object, right? Um, like how is the thing a product of deep thought um and it, it, if so i think then it's an is something that should be judged as such and i i you know i think then there is sort of a subjective layer of okay well what you know what does it look like which is i mean highly uh like uh, and then how does it work is it a pro like is, is it intuitive does it does does it do the job well and you have to kind of put them all together and i think people sometimes end up uh um a little bit over emphasizing the sort of how the quantifiable like uh, the highly utilitarian is uh, is a very reductionist uh, way of looking at things and so i think um it's it, utilitarian like pure utilitarianism is not uh, you know something my countrymen uh, tend tend to be like good at um, um but I, I i even there i would point out that like I mean, the, the big, biggest exports of the German economy certainly are the cars. And I, I, I do think they are very good examples of things that are not purely utilitarian. Like, I, I think logistically from A to B, like, you can, you can get everywhere pretty a lot cheaper. There's a lot of emotion underneath this. And I think the reason why was, was like, the cars that we are now all kind of picturing in our minds, why they do so well is because um, everyone who works on them knows this. This is not people cosplaying uh, car builders. This is this is people who have a extraordinarily strong sense of who they are building for, and they are they are they tend to be okay with not building for everyone. And I think this is one of those key things which is just hugely important. I mean, I'm sure this is a topic that comes up over and over and over again. Yeah, I I. I I'm remembering, I'm, I've actually been looking for it. This is an essay which must be 15 years old. It was written by Kathy Sierra. And I, I like, given the time, for, I, I forgot the name. But basically, it, it made a point which I think now is um, maybe better understood, but, like, was very new to me when, when, when I came across um, for the first time. But what she said is, she, she basically shortened diagram. Where, like, there was, like, love and hate on on, on both the sides. And it's sort of illustrated over the top that um, uh, uh, there's like a green zone close to both those things. And then there is a very large piece in the middle called irrelevance. And I think I, I, this is certainly one of our spiky opinions, which, you know, very sensibly people would take another side on. But I do believe that. I think if you, want, if you make something that anyone loves, people some people will also hate it. And I think actually the absence of someone hating it is actually a sign that the thing you did might be somewhere in the middle and not fully committed uh, to, to, to a particular vision. Yeah, and I think this is, this is a philosophy that I like to walk the line of, which is 
it's okay for someone to not like something as long as we're not getting in their way if they had to use it it still works and it works really well but you can have opinions about how something looks all day every day um and i i i personally really like pushing some of the work that we do at shopify to not do like i uh, one of the things i was saying to my team is like i care less about consistency than maybe i should as like mm-hmm. head of ux because it just consistency assumes norming and i'm kind of thinking that norming is a bit boring number one like i don't want to work on stuff that has already been defined uh it's also not why i came to shopify but it also it also means that we're not creatively expanding right like we're not trying new things we're not building and creating new paradigms and trying to like just extend the possibility um but it does connect to something maybe more practical which is the fact that we are seen in the world as being like um innovators in design systems because of how robust Polaris is and how mm-hmm. powerful it is and the fact that you know there's a bunch of places you can go on the internet that look very shopify because they basically just borrowed Polaris and that's a good thing but is it a burden for us i mean i'm asking that because i think it is but i'm interested mm-hmm. in your framing on that uh so um so here's the f- it, it, this, again, let's unpack this. So um, okay. <laughs> everything is a mixed bag, right? Like, uh, I mean, yeah. there is no free lunch, right? Like every every no. time you do something, you you also say no to something else and you have to be okay with that. Yeah. Um, the, the, like Shopify is very, very big software, very like, wide. I just checked. I think it's like um, something like two and a half million lines of code in TypeScript <laughs> just for the UX, right? Like it's just like, it's uh, so um, the, the scale <laughs> is sometimes enough. just the, like, yeah. absolutely... Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, we get an incredible amount of value uh, out of a design system. And in, at, at, at the size, uh, like the, the, the width of Shopify and all the screens it has, um, and, and, and um, the teams and the way, like um, the design system does something incredibly important, which is that we can um, put centrally a system together that then makes it easy for everyone to like succeed, uh, like to, 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 to it, it, what it does is it raises the floor a lot. And this, this sounds like, um, this sounds like downtime, uh, downside protection, but it actually, it's, it's incredible. Like for instance, when I, when, when, when I open VS code into, uh, uh, like an admin like project, um, even with my sort of programmer art kind of thing, I, I can actually do something that people can then reason about uh, if this is valuable to use. And that's, that's incredible. So design systems are incredible at uh, uh, raising floor. So where they can be problematic is if they lower the ceiling. And I think this is this is um, goes right back into this conversation about how thoughtful are people uh, when they build something, right? Like that, that we had earlier. Um, I, uh, especially when um, uh, design systems exist, they feel like a set of constraints, um, uh, even though they aren't. Like, and um, so, so this is a fine line, and actually a line that uh, requires constant adjustment in, in, in inside a company. And it, it's actually not a line that comes from restrictions in code. It actually, it's 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 a it's a cultural thing. It's like, what do you believe? Um, uh, this system should do for 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 you. Is it again? Is it does it help you get started, um, or uh, is it a, a set of, like that pushes conformity and uh, uh, sameness? And 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 it it certainly looks like that's what a design system would do. And and making it not do that is like a, a, you know is is a constant conversation that I I see teams having. And uh, I think this works well if you. Like if, if 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 you build your own design system, because then you have all the people who are who understand the reason why it exists there. Yeah. If you just adopt the design system from some other place, I think without understanding how uh, complicated this sort of cultural conversation can be, uh, it, it might end up restricting you quite a bit. Yeah, and I, I think we had a great conversation with Roy and Yesenia on one of the episodes, and that was part of the conversation, right? It's like this this idea of the ceiling going up and then the floor going up is like the design system helps us be mostly good and a lot of things that you would otherwise have to think about are kind of taken care of but then there's this other thing which is like well how high is the ceiling 
right? And mm-hmm. how creative can you still be even when you use that? And I, I think it's an interesting tension. And, and certainly like my push at the moment is sometimes start the Figma file without the UI kit, <gasps> like blank sheet of paper, <laughs> like just just do something that doesn't feel like anything else yet because we can always pull it back, but start with like a what if kind of question in your mind. And even given the breadth of like some of the solutions we're designing, like in my world, we're building financial products. Uh, The what if is not a Shopify competitor. It's a financial product that exists in the world. And so like even just starting from a blank sheet of paper and say, how do I solve this problem? And then I can work back. How does this problem fit inside Shopify later? But it is something that I think we have to keep pushing at that door that we're okay with possibility exploration and like, and this is touching on the next subject because this is, Mm -hmm. this is going to the, sometimes part of that work means coming up with wild shit that is not buildable. (laughs) Totally. And you said, you said something to me in, in, in the chat, you talked about the dribblification of design where like things are designed without hard constraints. And I feel like sometimes you should do that as a designer. Sometimes creatives need to let loose and shake off a boundary and do something that is way out there just to pull some good ideas into practical land. But I guess if you spend all your time on dribble, you're probably getting way too much of that and not enough of the practical experience, which is where designers get a little bit stuck. Um, So unpack that for me. What is that (laughs) dribblification of design, as you call it? Okay, so this is something um, that my co-founder, Daniel, who you should have on the show as well, um, uh, said a lot. Um, uh, The... If you, I mean, what, what, what you said often is like, if you take 10 random people off the street and you ask them all for your favorite color and you would then uh, sort of do an alpha blend on, on, on those colors, you would end up with mud brownish no one likes, which yeah, again, it's, we will <laughs> always end up coming to the same topic. I think what, yeah. um, which is uh, unfortunate because what you really should do is p- because every one of the individual colors that anyone picked would actually be a good solve where the blend isn't. So it, this is another w- for a way to come at uh, like consensus decision making is in a way of making great things. Like at some point you have to, I, 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 I think the best projects even though maybe not everyone is conscious of this, almost create a, um, a little bit of a uh, sort of democratic uh, uh, like uh, challenge to everyone. It's like about who cares most or who has the best sense for the constraints and possibilities and the highest ceiling and then creates the, a, a thing that just kind of is like, everyone looks at this and says, okay, that's the way to go, right? Like that's, I, I've seen a, like, and, and then, um, everyone says, okay, I'm going to support you on your vision with everything else I got. Like it, like the best pro, uh, teams tend to resemble almost, um, uh, uh, like jazz bands a little bit more than, 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 um, uh, like other analogies is where like one person is like, but it's, it's, it's like sets the key and the pace and then everyone else brings like everything they know about the instrument in it. And that's actually fluid and changes depending on the style of music that's coming. But like, it's, 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 it's very fluid and, and, and improv. And I, I love that process. I want, I think, um, I think constraints can be good if they facilitate more of that creativity to happen. Um, because for instance, like again, to back to the jazz uh, analogy here, um, a constraint that exists in there is like, everyone says, hey, that, from that time to that time, we're gonna yeah. play music. That's that's a constraint. Like yeah. people don't think about it so as much such. time. Yeah, mm-hmm. or so many players in the band. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so 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 anyway, you, um, what am I saying? Um, I'm saying like the, here's the problem with dribbleification as, as I see it. I'm, I'm not actually I, I'm not making a statement about dribble being bad. What I'm saying is like it's it's you you end up in a popularity contest, but popularity contest will always be won by the thing that is least objectionable. Um, because again, um, it's always going to be a much smaller group of people who love something, and then there's it's usually counterbalanced by someone who hates and uh, hates, it, and that gets you ha- like a middling score. Again, if you blend everyone's like, get the thing that no one hates, but more than fifty percent would like, it ends up doing better in design contests, um, uh, better popularity contests, and and the problem is, if, especially if then you spend a lot of your sort of creative output. Um, 
making things and posting them, you end up, uh, you, you will eventually like work towards an audience, but you will learn about what good looks like from a, uh, undifferentiated creative, um, creative, uh, um, like, like, a, a, like popularity contest rather than honing your own standards. And I think this is important. Um, uh, like people need to understand what, what, what great lo work looks like for themselves. I, I think it's, it's very, very good to like, uh, this is something I always pushed with all the engineers I ever worked with. And it's something that we use a lot, um, uh, in, in, in Shopify and, uh, you know, like I, I actually learned a lot from the world of UX and jazz, as I just said, um, I think one thing which really helps in the UX world is also learning engineering principle because every discipline is figuring out a lot of important things, which then become relevant to everyone. Um, so one thing I always pushed and it always horrifies people is deleting code. Like, um, the, uh, many very important features in Shopify. Breaking things I, basically. <laughs> yes. And, and well, not, not just remote, like subtracting things, but actually like we, when we net new features, we developed in such yeah. a way that we said this feature, the way we build this is we're going to start every single day from nothing yeah. and um, we ship it the day where the entire feature is going to be implementable in 24 hours uh, or in, in a single workday. And this sounds, this sounds surprising that this is a approach, but it led to probably some of the best code we've ever written um, and we worked as uh, pair programming um, uh, on, on these kind of things and we kept the unit tests. Um, but uh, the, the, the point of this was the following. Almost all of programming is not actually writing code, right? It's, it's what you actually do is you're building a model of a solution. Like how yeah. can I, like you, you, you're actually exploring the problem set deeply by uh, trying to reflect it as a model in, in, in code and then I, as an idea about UX and so on. And um, so 90% of the work on a project is actually this building up of your mental model, uh, using your creativity to find novel solutions to the same problem. Yeah. And uh, I think that's where like UX is, is, is that too. In fact, it's actually kind of better in the form that your deliverable at the end of the day is something that everyone can reason about rather than just other engineers. And I think it, it helps everyone. It is. I think the thing that I would add to that is that like the biggest difference for me between say like 2000s UX and say like the 10s and now we're entering into like the I don't know what we're calling them the 20s again <laughs> is how you marry up something that looks good with something that works really well and so for me like the analogy that I like to use is imagine like fashion houses your average person is not going to go to a couture fashion show but that couture fashion show and those highly opinionated super random designs inspire in-house designers mm -hmm. in Zara and H&M and like other brands and they cultivate ideas that become you know part of like clothes we wear every day and they're very useful and they're you know ready to wear type stuff but the the people who keep pushing the edges actually drag the rest of us with them as well so it's like totally. in UX it's making space for yes know what you're building yes know how it's being built and, and actually even taking constraints from the engineering right so like things like motion studies and um you know looking at key interactions and stuff like that but also giving yourself space to sometimes be like a couture a couture season or something like that anyway so like a couture season and just be like at sometimes I'm going to do like a runway show of just wild ideas and that's probably going to trigger a bunch of small improvements or ideas and creative in, in lots of other places that you know, people can pick up and, and build from in the depths of constraint land, you know? I totally agree. I, 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 I love this. I, I find it's super important to just explore. Like, I, I mean, again, I, I, the way I've always done this, and this might be not relevant, is like, is, is always by setting constraints, like, like for instance, time limits. And, um, um, uh, you know, like today I work only by using, I don't know, like, uh, my, my, um, uh, mouse with my left hand or something like this that sounds like a silly idea but like it's just like it's it's interesting how that changes things and you actually might end up winding getting some winding up with some empathy for um like it's actually uh, my guitar teacher told me once uh, when i was complaining about lack of progress it's like he just asked me hey turn around the guitar like play like just play the fretboard with the other side and then that was like terrible and and he said okay so did that feel harder to do than what you're doing um and i said yes and he said well that's like, that's exactly what it felt like the first time you picked up a guitar. So like, stop complaining about lack of progress. Right. So, and it's, it's, it's these kind thought. of things, exactly. Yeah. It's these kind of things that are just really, 
really useful. But then also, like, you know, just do something completely different, right? Like, yeah. um, uh, and, and again, every single time you do, you, you, you will come back from that particular journey with something that, like, the universe always conspires to make, make whatever you explored useful magically on in the next project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. You will learn hard and then you'll fold it in. So maybe on that question, um, what is something maybe in like the, how, what is our age? Because I see different things. Sometimes I see that we're 15, sometimes we're 17, but like Shopify is like 17 years old or something, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It depends on, we launched it 15 years ago and then it started uh, as the snowboard shop uh, 17 years ago. Okay. Yes. 17 years ago. Okay. So in the 15 years of official Shopify, what are some of the most spectacularly badly designed things that we, you know, shipped well-intentioned, but like in hindsight, you're just like, Ugh, either that didn't work or that was ugly AF and like, why did we do it? Oh, I mean, lots of things come to mind. I mean, if you go in a Wayback Machine to the first Shopify.com, it's rough. <laughs> well, so you did this, right? You you restored it the other day and I was looking, uh, you did had that project internally of like an old version of Shopify and I was like, oh, okay. This is super interesting, really cool to see, but also like, woof. <laughs> woof, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, to, to be fair, like sometimes you, we look at these uh, through the Wayback Machine on things and um, uh, we, we, we need to remind ourselves that we now have uh, high DPI displays that didn't exist back then. Yes. So like, uh, you know, the, the horrible looking and, images. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, like, so, so yes, we have, like, uh, we, we internally bootstrapped the Shopify Museum, which sort of implements, like, just, just is a version of Shopify as it was in the various years leading up to yeah. now, um, which is a very cool exercise because what you see is um, a, a lot of, a, I mean, a lot of, a lot of bones are there. Like it's, it's, it's um, yeah. um, this is a really important, especially in this context here. Um, Shopify fundamentally is uh, a, is a very, very, very successful company now that's got uh, launched based on UX, right? Like it's, it's, it's like, I, 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 I'm an engineer, but it, engineering was not the killer feature here. Shopify was not the first e-commerce software. Um, uh, and um, uh, it, it was the engineering side of a house kind of came to the task bringing what it's, it had and, 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 yeah. and, and that was enough. But the new thing, the unlock was, it was the first e-commerce software that was actually designed for like new brands to actually directly start like yeah. everything else in the industry before was to port existing businesses because that's yeah, where the money like was B2B which B2B makes products. sense yeah exactly and uh, try to get the existing retailers and we like because we were kind of building this for ourselves and we were like net like we, we wanted to start on it and not start like a, a retail business first um and uh that just kind of was a different set of constraints because suddenly we said, okay, well, we have to make something that's approachable to the people who are, want to like reach for independence during the lunch break. Like the people who are thinking about a plan B for their, um, uh, the side hustle, like, uh, special, you know, dream. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, um, that is like, we were forged in these fires, um, because that is like completely, so, so, so our, the, the, our users very different to everyone else were people who didn't know a lot about retail, didn't have a lot of time, didn't have uh, uh, like no money either, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, some VCs argued would make this a bad business. Um, and, uh, you know, like, but, but that doesn't matter because that was a mission, right? We, we were building for them. Um, yeah. And, and, and this meant that we would have to make something approachable, which was extraordinarily difficult to do at the time, especially at yeah. those times before you, we got all the goodies which we got since so yes um, the was so that was a yes so so that that, that that was the that's what we launched against like that the product was um taking insane um existing capabilities of a vo global world of uh, supply chains and retail uh with all its uh warehouse rotation centers uh um uh, ships containers and and all these things um and and, and making all that addressable through first software, model mm -hmm. that, and then mm -hmm. put a approachable UX on top of all this insanity that yeah. someone can use to run a side hustle for them. And that's, so it is a UX job, the whole company yeah. is. So I think this is why this has been such primary, uh, um, such a primary thing. And 
Um, this is also, I think, why we feel a little bit like, um, I, I, like I, I would like to think of Shopify as uh, being as intentional uh, about this. Like we, we, we've been at the forefront of like when I, uh, people are making fun of Web 2.0 now, but at some point that was basically what Web 3 is now. And so yeah, like, uh, exactly. it, it certainly was the place where like a lot of people brainstormed about, hey, how should we, how do internet, how does internet software looks like um, and, yeah. and how to make it better? Yeah. And uh, so, so we were a part of that mix. And so I think we should continue holding on to the standards of pushing this forward because the web browser is an amazing thing that would never be allowed into anyone's app store ever again. And, uh, you know, so making, uh, making the best use of it is very important. So you've kind of avoided my question, though, and you said you had a bunch <laughs> of examples of things that we didn't okay. do very well. So Shopify.com. Shopify yeah. com Wayback Machine is super embarrassing. I, 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 well, let's okay. see. Um, like, uh, I mean, my business cards were terrible. I found some recently. It's like horrible. I, I just, I mean, there's like some really dodgily designed things. To, like, here's what we did before design systems existed and the floor yeah. was easy to bring up. And, yeah. and this is like not a word of a lie. This is how it worked. And it's maybe like, uh, uh, like um, at some point, Daniel asked me to just stop cosplaying being a ux person or designer and 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 so like that he, he would like just make everything look good and um i should just do the programming and oh, so um, he kept you so, away from the yeah design yeah side. yeah <laughs> uh, so okay. so um uh uh but then i needed to hold him to like actually making things good before they go out for shipping and there's been actually some spectacular failures along both lines as well but so okay. where we ended up um uh, we, we agreed to do the following um there was a css class in our css files called i think it was called eye cancer <laughs> which is absolutely terrible and okay. uh, Things should that never give be you used eye as cancer. a term okay yes, yes. Uh, it, it, was, it was it was it was pink and and padding <laughs> of like uh like like 50 and like a blue border oh my God. and um, it sounds and amazing yes uh, so so basically <laughs> i was supposed to put eye cancer on everything i'm doing and then daniel would get uh, like a uh, like a message immediately and uh, knew what he would have to do before something went out to production so this is this, then, is, a, this is like a tag on toby stuff yes. so that it did not ship before it was actually designed yeah before the days of code reviews and pull requests and all these kind okay. of things we didn't have uh, so uh, that was a way we worked together I quite like the idea of you doing rogue design shit and like sneaking it into production and having someone else come down on you and be like, what the hell have you done? Um, I, there was a famous case of uh, me shipping something that still involved, uh, like, uh, sadly, exactly this particular uh, CSS class um, and then having to run to the airport and being on a flight to um, uh, uh, like Europe. And um, uh two things happened during this time a there was like a, a, a downtime issue and there was production code which um um uh you know involved that and then so both of those things because i somehow needed to ship to production before going to the airport and then there was a bit of a family intervention in early shopify with uh <laughs> shipping to production um anyway good stuff, good times <laughs> Keeping Toby away from design. Because, okay, because in today's <laughs> era, you do not stay away from design. Like, you're in our UX channels. You give a ton of really good feedback. Sometimes it's a bit like, Toby hates it. And people are like, oof, what do we do? Like, so how, how do you kind of mm. rationalize that old involvement in UX where you kind of had Daniel as your buffer to, like, today's model, we've got well, hundreds of UX people across the company uh, doing a bunch of different things. But, like, you are very, very present, like, sometimes in our creative work and shaping what goes out like would we be able to ship something that you didn't like but you felt like it did the job really well sure absolutely um okay it's um uh i um i i don't, I don't think i hold this um i i don't think my involvement is uh that much on taste and aesthetics it's up on the um uh the consideration that went into it usually right like it's like does, is everyone because like, I, you know, one thing, you know, I have two advantages. Uh, uh, like, I mean, I generally have fairly high standards, in, like for myself and uh, for the company, which is useful. Um, uh, oh, you know, well, lots of people have that. And uh, um, uh, so that's not my main uh, contribution. My main contribution is I've seen, uh, uniquely, I've seen all 17 years of this company. And, and so I, I, I know the conversations leading up to the conversations. Um, and I... Um, uh, so I can help like discover what's behind things and I can, um, I know the 
merchants really well. I, I, I know um, I've, I've talked with thousands and tens of thousands of them over the years. I, I, I know what they tell me about the early days. I have empathy because I sell myself. I'm a user of Shopify, so I, so I have that perspective. So, so the thing I tend to spend, uh, like give most feedback on is when um, I see like a category error around um, the, the empathy and mental state that the users might be in. Like, I mean, you, you're talking about building financial products, um, which is like, so this is like very, very, very common in, in your space. But you like, when, when you're building a user interface, you're building not just for like a, um, you know, sometimes there's these baseball cards of people and, and some of them have a lot of context, but some of them, like often they talk a little bit more about socioeconomic uh, things rather than actually what are they trying to do, right? Like what's the job to be done? And especially around finance, like the amount of like <sighs> anxiety is massive, right? Like it's like, um, like where you meet people is like, it needs to be clear to everyone who's designing the interface because um, I mean, I, I just even today I had, we had a conversation um, in, a, in, a, in another forum about we were talking about charts and I, I, I'm trying to poke holes into people's use of red in, 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 in um, the color red, like color red is wonderful in the context of destructive operations. I think then it's like, that's exactly where people actually should um, worry about. But like, if, if it's like, hey, we're like in a week after, we're recording this in a week after Black, uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So, so basically there's millions of um, Shopify stores now, right now, which have a week over week um, uh, 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 growth number, which is probably a reduction. And that is not, hey, stop what you're doing and pay attention to this number. That is just simply an occurrence that has to do with um, the, the, the business. So like empathetically, we are suggesting to people that they should be worried about something when they shouldn't. So like, anyway, this is a very long, this is a random example of the kind of discussions I have with, uh, with people because I'm trying to say is that should probably be gray because it's expected. Green yeah. is notable yeah. because something yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, colorblindness allowing. I think what I'm hearing yeah, is yeah, of course. the pattern, the pattern, like what is the pattern that's been communicated yeah. here? It's like, should you, should you be worried about the thing that you're seeing? Are oh. you supposed to take action on it? or not. And like, I, I think also speaking to the type of person we're helping on Shopify, we're not assuming a level of business now. So just like literacy and finance and retail operations, that means that they look at these things and just get it straight away. You kind of have to just provide a little bit more of a, a step, right? To, to get them totally. to a healthier space. So I get that. Okay. We're almost at time, but I want to, I want to do I want to do one crazy thing with you, Toby, because you're 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 on Twitter a lot. You talk about Discord and Reddit. Um, kiss, marry, kill. Twitter, Discord, Reddit. Kiss, marry, kill. Yeah, this is the kind of CEO friendly version that's not using a swear word, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So sorry, I I, I need to reason for this like you're giving me three things and i'm supposed to do three different things and i need to, yeah, this yeah. is like an exclusive set right like okay so you're not like, playing I, I, I think I, I think i need a stat solver for this this is complicated okay no no but this is okay so this is a great game i just did it at a burst last week and totally freaked my team out but it, it is like forcing you into a binary decision about each product which one would you kiss so essentially which one is kind of like the fleeting mm -hmm. fancy which one are you staying with in a long-term relationship in a sort of marriage which one are you killing and it's just a great way to draw out like how you're seeing these different services and the purpose that they serve for you. Because you're you're very active on all of them. And I think people can find you in a bunch of places mm. having various chats. Uh, so I'm just interested in how you see it. Super. Uh, and, and it's, sorry, it was, it was Discord, Twitter, and? Reddit. Reddit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 okay, I, I would, hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, okay, I, I'd kill Twitter because Twitter okay. is uh, uh, like just like I have the strongest emotion to um, uh, yeah. like here. Tends to bring um, out the strongest emotions in other people too, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd marry Reddit just because of the like wonderful frivolousness and crazy that's, I mean, there. But honestly, here's the thing, like, like yeah. these are like Russia tests, right? Like it's like my, like my filter bubble on Reddit is just very different from my filter bubble on Twitter. Okay. I, I think I think I think uh, Discord is. 
I can't decide if Discord is great UX or not. It's like this sort of hot mess that somehow always has these moments of delight in it. Uh, yeah. You know, like it's just kind of, um, yeah. so maybe, maybe that's how I saw it out, but that's complicated. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing, so for me, my, my answer to that is I would also kill Twitter just because it doesn't seem to lend itself to, it has this impermanence yeah. where people kind of basically shit statements and then run off and create controversy and it's not a big deal. I'd probably kiss Reddit just because I feel like it's great, but it's also so, it's, it, I, I find it's kind of like the precursor to what Discord is, which is yeah. much more community oriented, deeper conversations, higher quality sources. Like if I get something from Discord, I feel like I could probably trust it a bit more than Reddit and a heck of a lot more than anything I got off Twitter. So you kind of have this, yeah. you know variance there and and the design i mean to speak to the design of the three twitter is probably the friendliest in terms of the user experience but i have found that discord and reddit have been highly intuitive and that's mm -hmm. something that like my holy grail of design is you look at it and you can have all sorts of opinions but everything you think you want to do is extremely intuitive and so you're basically learning with every single click every single action does exactly what you expect and I kind of feel like Discord is nailing that. Um, Reddit definitely is that, but Discord is nailing that. I, I totally agree. I, I, I think like what I, this particular, I, I tend to call this approachability, but that's probably not the right term. It's there's, a, there's this sort of unfolding appropriateness of, 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 a, of a UX that just kind of works in a way that's like, it just feels empowering. It's, it's and, and, you know, I, I talk a lot about it. I think the goal of, uh, um, but I think the goal of a, a particular user interface should be to delight. Um, and delight is always is, is, is comes it's a from controversial term in UX these days. You know, people are really wearing. Oh, why is delight. that? Uh, because it 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 speaks to like frivolous. Like, does it actually drive purposeful? And if you start with delight, are you actually problem solving first? But I, I hear what you're saying about delight being a part of how the experience is delivered. I, I, I think it depends on where you put delight. Like if, 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 you, yeah. if you make delight, and I mean, I, I would say like, I, I would only get into delight after the utilitarian values are done and, and, and after the thing is like easy to reason about. Like, I think this is exactly where like, like delight in, in, in the Discord sense comes from uh, the, the, when you type a word that maybe you could use an emoji for, then it's instead of putting some auto suggest thing, it like, it animates a little icon in yeah. the bar and you clicks and it's, it's like, an, it, it's like, it does the right thing, but it over delivers. This is like, I think the light, I mean, the, I mean, I might use this differently than what people want to currently not have in terms of light, but like, to me, it's like, it's just like, you take the actual experience, um, uh, you, you take your expectations uh, and then minus the experience or you, like do it the other way around just to have a positive number. And whatever the difference is, 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 is the delight factor. It, it's an outperformance. It's, it's, it's almost like a display of mastery over the uh, task that can, that can only be achieved by the teams that so fully understood it that they ended up um, being able to spend the little bit of extra thing just to outperform what even reason like reasonably uh, uh, well versed people in the tool would ever expect of the team. So yeah, it, it also like makes me it, it it's great, but it also makes me think of the Kano model. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So the no. so the Kano model is like this old manufacturing concept of like uh, there's exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, and then under delivering on expectations, and over time the things that exceed will eventually become the expectation. And then the mm. things that are the expectation will eventually go below. And so it pushes you to say, like, if you're reaching for the top, you're actually having to fight to stay there because you should be yeah. continuous improvement mindset about like, what is an expectation and what's that other level that you're going to go to because today's expectations are tomorrow's like, whatever kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because this is a concept that actually like, so it clearly comes from out of manufacturing, but people have been, uh, like the philosophers have been talking about this for like yeah, thousands exactly. of years, right? Like, I mean, you, you encounter this in, in even just sort of like life experience uh, under the term of a hedonistic treadmill, right? Like people yeah. just, norm it normalizes it to what to your, your ambient experiences. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, like, 
So, so I, I, I mean, I think this is a very real thing. Um, like this is a very interesting thing about standing up this sort of Shopify museum. Like, like this, what was like killer UX in 2006 um, uh, uh, is like hilariously, like, like the, the entropic, like damage that has been caused there is like incredible, right? Like it's no, uh, and um, it, that's just a sign for that our standards have evolved with, again, the people just, uh, uh, you know, moving forward. Um, and, uh, you know, but, I mean, this is like an entire other conversation about what, you know, I, 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 so by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm reverse engineering why I think delight is actually ought to probably be treated with contempt um, here because um, I, 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 I think stated outside of the context of that it's something like it is something that cherry on top after everything, like it's the f finding, like after you found the Venn diagram of all the stakeholder requirements of the interface, finding the perfect spot in it is like the delight thing. But if, if that's not clear, then uh, people might over optimize for, 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 for parents potentially, or more importantly, um, uh, go into the biggest trap of all, which is like wanting perfection, right? This is where everything goes wrong because again, the, um, That's like, never even, if you ever, even if you try to hold yourself to perfection and even if you actually ship something so far ahead of what where everyone else is like, this very thing about the hedonistic treadmill of design on the yeah. internet will outpace you so much because it's everyone much else faster. is going to be faster. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Toby. Okay, last last thing, gimmick for the episode. So we've got here a, a chatterbox, which I hope you can see. We have yes. four options. Do you remember these games? Did you play it as a kid? Uh, uh, vaguely. Vaguely. I don't. I, I I know the shape. I don't. I've never so played a game with a shape. It's kind of there are questions in here. There are one of eight questions, and we're just gonna play. We're gonna play it. So first, okay. I need you to pick either the cart, the rocket, the lettuce, or the banana. I take the. Well, the cart, clearly. The cart, okay. C-A-R-T. Okay, you have the numbers three, four, seven, and eight. Pick one. It's eight is like I take eight because everyone usually picks seven, right? Well, so I learned from my team that actually that means i got to do another round. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, now you have one, two, five, and six. Okay, I'll go with one. Okay. Question number one is, let's go here. Oh, what design book are you currently reading? And maybe if it's not a design book, but it's design adjacent or interesting, it might be good to know what, what are you reading? Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm reading a book co uh, called uh, Crafting Interpreters, which is about designing programming languages, which is actually also design, um, but that oh, probably doesn't qualify. Um, <laughs> Uh, which, de which design book am I reading? Nah, not, 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 not reading one sadly right now. Um, okay. But what is that? What is that designing technologies book? Like what is, what is uh, that book it's, uh, crafting interpreters is, uh, it's, it's, it's such a book that got recommended by one of our internal teams. So it's with one with Ruby VM. I, I find programming language design to be like a fascinating part because again, it's exactly at this intersection. Like I, I, like I, I'm, it, I'm insanely excited about everything that uh, gets more out of technology to power human minds, like uh, or human uh, like journeys. Shopify is literally that, um, and uh, so so. I, but like I have a sort of subplot of like I find just programming language design to be fascinating because uh, so so uh, like I, I I just want like I I've built some myself, like including Liquid, which powers Shopify. So uh, every once a couple of years, I get back to this topic and. Uh, that book is just kind of neat because it discusses the pros and cons and, and go, gets at it with a little bit more of um, computer science rigor than I have because I'm, I, I, I never studied computer science. So Yeah, um, nice. Okay, that's one for our UX audience to maybe go look and see if we're interested in. <laughs> like so often what the way we bring our own, especially our, like the technology world is was right to reject status quo because of where we, like it's just, Computers were so net new that we kind of had to reinvent everything, but we now understand them so well that we actually really have to go back through time and learn from the greats in all the different disciplines, right? Like, because every discipline it ultimately is like this, like long quests, which discovers a set of like a very few universal truths that then 
just come back in, in with new and novel ways. And like, sometimes it's just faster to just, because the grades in these other fields actually told us what they discovered in their books or biographies. And um, uh, it, it just, it's, it, it's just a good life hack to just, you know, uh, go to them, figure out what their field um, uh, had for a set of problems, figure out how they solved it and then see if it applies. Yeah. This is kind of how I use uh, Asimov books because there's probably <laughs> a bunch of stuff in there as well. Um, Toby, thank you so, so much for this conversation. This has been really good fun and interesting for our audience to hear about your perspectives on UX. And yeah, I'm excited to see what other stuff we can do at Shopify that will keep folks interested in uh, in us and our mission. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, it's, a, it's a really fun company. We are building awesome stuff. And uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic us. place to spend a, a couple of years surrounded by amazing people like Lola and team um, yeah. and uh, um, working on really, really thing, um, important things that just help, um, you know, when it, you, you help millions of uh, small businesses reach for independence and uh, sometimes make huge, huge, huge contributions to their local economies and uh, yeah. uh, all these kind of things. So it's, it's a good place and we really value this work and have sometimes interesting conversations and sometimes uninteresting conversations as UX, as you just... Uh, <laughs> this was definitely an interesting one. <laughs> exactly. Christopher Alexander is there the okay. uh, name, name of the author. I'll send you, I'll send you uh, the name oh, of the yes. book. Oh yes, we'll get the book link in. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Inside Shopify UX. Check out more from our team or find out how to join us by visiting ux.shopify.com. Inside Shopify UX is hosted by me, Lola Yelayo Pearson. Produced by Jen Shaw. Assisted by Isabel hamel Karassi. Edited by Michael Busser. With art and graphics by Alicia Giroux. Danny Chavez-Ackerman. And Trevor Slovani. Music by Silent Quiet Spaces. Make sure you're subscribed to Inside Shopify UX for next week, where we'll be finding flexibility in complexity. <laughs>